The story begins in a world where, when a human is born, they are blessed with a job by the goddess of light and a skill by the goddess of darkness. If one has a job that complements the skill, they can gain various abilities and excel in their ranks. However, once a person is assigned a job, they cannot change it, meaning that the moment a person is born in this world, life is already unfair. This is the case for Ain, who has the job of an appraiser. While he is grappling with these thoughts, his allies are battling for their lives against monsters. The man fighting off a monster turns to Jolene, questioning when she is going to be done with her spell. Calm as always, Jolene asks for a moment to complete it, and the next moment she smashes the monster with a fireball, ending the fight in one spell. Ain is called out to collect the trash, but he is not pleased with being called a trash collector. However, his anger turns into embarrassment when he bumps into a stone and falls on his face. Zoid, the swordsman, looks down on Ain, calling him useless, and Jolene does not mince words either she believes that compared to ace jobs like theirs, Ain is nothing but trash. Ain is agitated that the two are looking down on him because they have uncommon jobs and see themselves as greats. In this world, jobs are divided into three categories, the first are common jobs like the one Ain has, the second are uncommon jobs like Zoids and Jolene's, and the last are rare jobs held by only a handful of people. Jobs with fighting abilities are called uncommon jobs, including swordsmen, magicians, etc., while the common jobs are those with the least significance, such as coal miners, farmers, peasants, laborers, etc. On top of that, jobs are usually hereditary, meaning that if the father is a farmer, the child will end up becoming a farmer as well. Moreover, it's rather easier to carry on the father's job, providing a comfortable way to live life in this unfair world. For those who seek thrill in life, there is a way for them. It's called being an adventurer. Adventurers make money by taking down monsters and using the materials from them. There is a high chance that one can find a precious jewel or item from a monster, which can instantly make them rich. In the pursuit of this shortcut to wealth, many kids often reject their parents' advice about jobs and turn into adventurers. However, this is not the case with Ain. His parents died when he was young, and the family business was forced to shut down. Thus, he had no other choice but to become an adventurer. But before our MC could recall further, Zoid's striking voice brings him back to the present, shouting at Ain to quickly appraise the monster. Ain uses his appraising abilities to assess that the monster they just defeated is a giant rat. Its D-ranked teeth can be used to make weapons, and amongst the ranks, F is the lowest and S is the highest. This means that D barely ranks above F, making it something mediocre. Unable to open the mouth of the corpse, our weakling MC asks Zoid for help. But Zoid can't help but lash out at this trash collector for asking him to do such dirty work. It's something only the trash collector should do. Agitated by the insult, Ain sneers at Zoid, but it doesn't sit well with Zoid, who lands a fatal kick on his face, sending him rolling on the ground. Even Jolene is not pleased with Ain for daydreaming all day. She believes they put their lives on the line to protect this weakling, and all he does is daydream. He's saddened by their treatment, but deep down in his heart, Ain realizes that whatever they are saying is true. Ain is good for nothing. Not only is his job one of the common ones, but it's also considered unlucky. Moreover, with no fighting skills on his side, it's hard for Ain to evolve from his present situation. Thus, all he can do is tear apart the dead corpses of monsters and gather materials from the garbage. Although the job is surely unlucky, at least they can take the corpse to the guild first and then hand him some tools to appraise it. In contrast, he has only been given a magical bag to put things in. He has to do the rest by himself. Unfortunately, once he is done with the rat corpse, and before he can get himself out of the mess, Zoid spots a corpse of a hellhound nearby and orders our poor MC to go and recover the materials from the hellhound corpse as well. But Ain is rather shocked to find a hellhound in his dungeon. It's strange to have hellhounds here, and he brings this to Zoid's attention. However, Zoid is too arrogant to listen to anything and orders Ain to do what he is told. Shortly after, they spot another hellhound, and tries to bring this to Zoid's notice, explaining that not only is this passage not on the map, but the presence of hellhounds is also strange. It could be a sign of something more vicious. Zoid mistakes his clarifications as pretext to avoid any further appraisals and decides to go himself. When Ain tries to stop him, Zoid orders him to leave the bag behind. He isn't shy about firing Ain for disobeying him. Poor Ain has no choice but to follow Zoid's lead, since there are not many teams out there who would accept him with his lowly job. He struggled a lot to secure himself a position with Zoid and doesn't want to risk losing it. 
Taking this ominous route that was not part of the dungeon, they find hordes of hellhound corpses. Zoid and Jolene are shocked with excitement so many corpses mean huge sums of money. Hellhound materials are highly valued in the market, but for Ain, this isn't just strange, it's terrifying. Who on earth could kill so many hellhounds? If it had been an adventurer like them, they would have pounced on the materials right away. This means the corpses didn't come from adventurers. Before they can get their hands on the hellhounds, a massive horde of hellhounds appears before them, causing them to tremble in fear. Ain is spinning out of control at the number of monsters in front of him, and even Jolene is beginning to fret. Shockingly, Zoid turns to Jolene and asks her to cast paralysis magic on Ain so they can use him as bait and run unscathed. They leave Ain paralyzed and flee for their lives, leaving him behind as nothing more than food for the hounds. Ain can only cry over his helpless state, unable to do anything for himself. However, he somehow manages to break free from the magic and runs toward the exit, only to find that he's trapped. The two greedy adventurers have left him as mere bait. Running for his life, Ain reaches a dead end. He's cornered if he turns back, the hounds will tear him apart, and if he jumps into the abyss, he'll fall to his death in the ominous depths of the dungeon. In the end, Ain concludes that he's a weakling, and death from the fall might be more peaceful than being butchered by the hounds. He decides to jump off the cliff. Instead of shattering into pieces from the fall, Ain lands in an unknown place. A creature kisses his forehead, and when he opens his eyes he finds himself alive, his wounds healed, lying in the water before a huge tree. This is where his life began to change. Although he is saved and unharmed, Ain is unable to comprehend how he survived such a fall. This is no ordinary water, it's the droplets of Guashal, a healing item that can recover all wounds in no time, and also contains the ingredients of an elixir. That's not all, there are only nine such trees in the world. These trees provide unlimited mana to the world and can surprisingly grow without sunlight. It's shocking for him that Yggdrasil really exists since these trees were long thought to have vanished from sight and were only considered mythical beings that once existed in the world. It was long believed that mana came from Yggdrasil, and when the trees withered, shockingly enough, the mana supply did not end. Long search operations were conducted to locate them, however, no one could succeed. While thanking the sacred tree for saving him, Ain senses a presence but turns around and finds nothing. Wondering if there is someone near him, Ain now ponders how he is going to make it out of this. What's even more shocking is that he is still in the dungeon with no monsters in sight. However, there is also no hope of help here. Instead of starving to death, Ain decides to find a way to exit. He thanks the tree again before his departure and soon finds himself standing before a pitch dark scary exit. He is afraid that there might be stronger monsters than the hellhounds, but still, he must rely solely on himself to find a way out. He heads out in the hope of finding an escape, and the next thing he knows, his ear and fingers have been cut, and he stands before an S-ranked gremlin monster. The monster doesn't spare a minute in attacking him from all directions, scratching off his entire body. But, shockingly, the gremlin stops attacking, leaving Ain wondering what has gotten into the monster all of a sudden. However, the poor MC does not realize that there is an even bigger problem standing tall behind him. It's an S-ranked death bear that smashes him across the wall. Out of nowhere, a girl jumps into the chaos and saves our hero. The next thing he knows, this beautiful girl is offering him tea. Ain is lost in her beauty when a striking voice pulls him out of his imagination. A lady scolds him and asks Ain to be thankful to them for serving him this sacred tea, and he should repay them with his soul. Unsure of who the ladies are, Ain questions them, but the ladies seem to have had enough of his silly blabbering and forcibly spill the tea into his gut. The tea is definitely delicious, and Ain can't hold himself from thanking the girl. However, the lady is sneering at him and warns him not to have any lustful thoughts about her daughter, or she will end his life in no time. After the tea, Ain questions why they saved him, and the lady straightforwardly tells him that she had no interest in saving a lowlife like him. However, it was her daughter who insisted on saving him. It turns out that the girls are mother and daughter. The mother, Ursula, is the guardian of Yggdrasil, and Yuri is her daughter. She has been looking after the remaining Wygdrasils in the world to protect them from falling into the wrong hands. To his surprise, Yuri is Wygdrasil, or the spirit of Yggdrasil, but it's something very complicated for humans to understand. Ain realizes why she is so beautiful, probably because she is Wygdrasil. However, Ursula does not buy it, she does not want Ain to even see her, so he may not breed any illicit thoughts about her. Ain questions how he has eyes when his eyes and fingers were cut by the monsters, and Ursula explains that the droplets of Yggdrasil can cure wounds, 
but cannot bring back the original parts of the body that were lost. Thus his eyes are artificial Yuri has created them out of her own parts. On top of that, Ursula has also placed some of her own powers in the new eye so he could see things he never could before. It turns out that Yuri went this far in saving him because he said thanks to her. Out of so many people who fell here, none said thanks to Yuri when she helped them. Moreover, when they realized that she is Wygdrasil, they cut her branches and plucked her leaves, which is why his words really hit her heart. He thanks Yuri again, and she is clearly flustered, but Ursula is rather cold-hearted. She wants him to leave now. Yuri appeans that it is not safe for him, knowing that the swarm of monsters outside will kill him in no time. Yuri presses that Ursula should help him out in a safe exit, and Ursula maintains that as a guardian of Yggdrasil, she can't go beyond a certain distance. And her teleportation magic also cannot be used in this mage. Yuri breaks into tears upon hearing this. Eventually Ursula agrees to help him, despite the fact that going against her principles for this lowly creature does not make sense to her as well. Thus she proposes a shockingly appealing solution, training him to empower him so he can get out of the mess with his own skills. It's exactly what Ain always looked for he will now be training with the oldest and the strongest sage of all time. To his further shock, she is not training him like an ordinary disciple, she is rather throwing him straight into the mess to learn with her. Ain is cursing himself for not being able to see anything, and this does not sit well with Ursula, who thinks he is not using the abilities bestowed from the core of Yggdrasil. So she first starts with self-awareness to familiarize the kid with his powers. Earlier, Ain's eye was cut down by the bear, and he was thrown into pitch darkness. And now, the dungeon that was once pitch black is now lit up, and he can see everything way more clearly than ever. Thus she begins the training, and the first monster he faces is the gremlin from earlier. The first step in the training is to be able to dodge all the attacks. She reminds him of his job of appraisal, and soon Ain begins to read the attacks properly, but he fails to dodge in time and ends up losing his ear again. Luckily, Yuri had already given some droplets to save him during the training in his exit, and Ursula uses the drops to cure him. With time, Ain begins to anticipate his attacks properly, but he is still far from reacting in time. He is struck with the sudden realization of the powers he may hold in the spirit eye, and once using it properly, he can now anticipate everything clearly. He even manages to dodge one attack as well. This lights the hope of changing his life, from being lowly to the one with the strongest dodging abilities. It's been a week training to dodge the monsters, and now he is able to easily read and dodge those attacks but the training is far from over. Ursula now takes it to the next level, where Ain must defeat the gremlin. Ursula understands that his job is not about attacking and such her aim is to help him get the most out of this eye and defeat the monsters. To fight the gremlin, she barely hands him a sword. Out of nowhere, Yuri appears in the training area to give him her branch to fight, and to Ursula's further shock, it's the superior branch. Ain uses the tree branch to attack and fails badly. Ursula asserts that, even though Ain can anticipate the attacks, with the he won't be able to land one solid blow. On the other hand, Ain is contemplating how to attack and decides to put the wooden sword in the way, where he knows the monster will attack and it will be exposed. However, this trick does not work because his enemy can also read what he is aiming at. Thus, Ain decides to make the necessary tweaks in his attack. He is having a hard time thinking from a human perspective and with the gifted eye. Thus, he decides to leave it all to the eye from Yggdrasil. Shockingly enough, he can now see the axis of attack and the gremlin is moving frame by frame, making it easier to attack. With this, he manages to kill the gremlin in a single attack. His task is now to defeat all those S-ranked gremlins in this area. It's been three days since he was assigned the task of eliminating the gremlins, and now Ursula sits on the corpses of the gremlins. For some reason, she is not happy. She believes it should have been far easier than this. She now takes him to the next phase of training. He has to use the gremlin corpses to appraise their abilities and make those abilities his own. He has been appraising monsters all his life, however. Ain is still uncertain if he will ever be able to make those abilities his own. Ursula is quick to remind him that the powers he has gained from the spirit eye are enough to help him appraise the abilities of the monsters, and the knowledge he will receive will not just be knowledge he can store it and make it his own. This is the moment of his life, the one he has been waiting for all his life. He can't help but wonder how helpful Yuri has been to him. She has helped him turn his entire life upside down. He gets close to the gremlin, and with the spirit eye, Ain manages to store the S-rank speed ability. Ain feels strong jolts throughout his body. It's sensing faster than before, and when he attempts to test it, Ain is left in shock at how fast this sloppy weakling has turned. However, he cannot maintain the pace and falls flat on his face because 
Despite copying the abilities from the monster, his body is still weak and unable to maintain the speed for long. Thus Ursula asserts that there is only one way for Ayn if he intends to maintain the pace, he has to train his body and get stronger. He falls again and again, but Ursula is unfazed. She only knows one way, and that is to run until your insides come out, run until your gut spills out. The words instill a subtle motivation in Ayn, who runs as if it's his last run in life. He runs until his muscles stop tearing and his legs grow ridiculously stronger. As time passes, his strength begins to grow, and the training continues to become more rigorous. In the following days, Ayn questions Ursula if he can now adopt the abilities of the Death Bear. However, Ursula writes off the idea for the time being, since adopting the abilities is a tough and painful process. For this, he first needs to get rid of the Death Bear and make sure he does not get attacked by it. Although it's a tough call for her, seeing his dedication to the training, Ursula decides to hand him one of her abilities as well. With a sudden flip, Ayn feels fire running through his body. When he cools down, Ursula explains that she has given him the chant cancel ability. It can be used during the chanting of a magic spell. Usually spells are long, and one can be easily attacked during the chants however. With this ability he can now use magic with no lag time. Ayn wastes no time in copying the chant cancel on fireball spells. Although it hasn't been easy, and our poor MC sustained multiple fireballs until he could get his hands on the fireball spell, eventually he makes it. Pleased by his performance in adopting the spells, she now hands him the Wind Blade ability. As time passes, he learns more about the spells and masters them, but learning the spells does not come easy. He sustains numerous injuries while learning a new spell. However, it's been five days since he started grinding hard, and now he has managed to wave off Ursula's anger. Still, Ursula thinks there is much more to be done with his magic abilities. Although he has copied the spells, he lacks power in them, since he is a weakling by profession. Yuri comes to his rescue again, she uses the droplets not only to recover him but also to increase his magic capacity. However, his trainer is certainly strict. She does not cut him any slack. For Ursula, it's not only about taking in the droplets, he still has to train hard to defeat the Death Bear. Yuri says a word in Ayn's favor, but Ursula has only one thing on her mind training in magic. In the next training session, Ayn performs much better than usual. He not only fights well but also has Yuri backing him up recovering him from his injuries. The training continues for days and nights, and after half a month, Ayn, once a weakling, is now a full-blown magician. Ursula believes that she has invested enough in Ayn, and that he has trained himself to be strong enough to head into a revenge match with that gnarly bear. Death Bear is undoubtedly a fearsome monster. Its massive, vicious claws can cut through anyone or anything. Ayn observes the bear from a distance, and its deadly presence sends waves of terror through him. Even Ursula notices Ayn's hesitation and motivates him, reminding him that he is far stronger than before and can now face this monster with ease. Eventually, Ayn musters the courage to step out and fight, throwing numerous fireballs at the Death Bear. However, since he is not a natural magician, not a single fireball hits the target. After confusing the bear, Ayn uses his, his super speed to get closer and then unleashes wind blades to smash the bear into the walls. Although Ayn realizes his magic is far from perfect, he decides to keep attacking until the bear is defeated. Moving in even closer, Ayn summons 100 fireballs to finish off the once fearsome, now seemingly timid, death bear. After defeating it, Ayn reflects on whether the bear was always this weak, or if he has grown significantly stronger. With the battle over, Ayn quickly copies the abilities of the death bear. Ursula then declares the completion of his training. With the conclusion of his training, it is now time for Ayn to part ways with the tree and these amazing people. Yuri hands him the remaining part of Yggdrasil's core as a parting gift, explaining that with it, he can create a new spirit eye. However, Ayn opines that this gift is too huge for him to accept, but Ursula explains that it is only a rental, and, upon his death, it is bound to return to the tree itself. With this, Ursula transplants the remaining core into his eye, and claims that, as time passes, the power of the spirit will increase. He looks around and does not find Yuri anywhere, but shortly after, she appears by his side out of nowhere. It turns out that with the spirit of the eye and the core of Yggdrasil in his eye, it is now equal to the tree itself, and Yuri can reside within it. Ayn questions whether Ursula is okay with Yuri being with him. Ursula bursts out that, although she isn't, there isn't much she can do. Ever since Yuri's birth it has only been the two of them here, and Yuri has always felt the urge to make new friends. All the humans she saved before Ayn were hungry for her power once they learned she was the tree of Yggdrasil. However, Ayn proved himself to be far different from the others. Although Ursula wants to be with her daughter when she goes out into the world with Ayn, she understands that, despite being sloppy and idiotic at times, 
Ayn has the heart of a good, kind human. In response, Ayn vows to prove her trust right. Ursula asks him to stick out his hand, equipping him with unlimited magic storage. She explains that if he can activate the crest, he can store numerous items in it. She also decides to give him the spirit sword, but before handing it to him, she smashes the sword directly into his eye. Then she gives him a sage stone to swallow. It turns out that what she gave him was a magical tracker, allowing her to link with him anytime she wants. She can talk to him and keep an eye on him to ensure he doesn't do anything inappropriate with her daughter. With this, his preparations are complete. He is now equipped with the spirit eye, the sage's magical stone, the magic sword, and the spirit of Yuri. Finally, he is ready to set out. He will soon reach the surface, but escaping through the dungeon will not be a walk in the park for our hero. Firstly, the paths are complicated, and secondly, he will encounter enemies on his way out. Thankfully, he is accompanied by the sage Ursula and Yuri, who guide him on his exit. Ursula has already mapped out the route for them but warns Ayn that he will soon face a monstrous viper. This creature is equipped with acid capable of dissolving anything it touches, so she advises Ayn to make full use of his eye to detect and avoid any incoming threats. Heading straight into battle with the monstrous snake, Ayn first throws his sword. Sensing that it hits the target, he charges in after it. Making the most of his sword, he cuts through the snake and feels a sense of satisfaction as he sees an S-rank snake fleeing from him in fear. However, Ursula doesn't let him dwell on this victory or rest. She urges Ayn to deal with the snake quickly and assists him by appraising the monster, enabling him to gain its abilities in no time. Ayn turns to Yuri and thanks her, acknowledging that all of his progress has been possible because of her. Moving forward, our main character finds himself standing before a massive door, ready for the next challenge. Wondering if he will have to go through the door, Ursula reminds him that he has no choice he must go through it. She explains that all dungeons have a boss, the strongest of the dungeon monsters and to complete the dungeon quest, the boss must be eliminated first. Moreover, dungeons are like living beings with a heart, but these dungeon hearts can be broken. To prevent this, every dungeon has a savior to protect the heart from destruction. Although Ayn has defeated several S-ranked monsters, and as Ursula and Yuri by his side, he still fears that this encounter will not be like the usual outings he has had recently. Strolling through the door, Ayn reaches the heart of the dungeon and spots a dungeon core. However, a summoning circle stands in his way. As he approaches, a massive boss monster appears before him. Though Ayn begins to doubt his abilities and feels intimidated by the monster's size, the ladies reassure him that he is strong enough to fight and win. The attack speed from the giant monster is rather slow, however. Ursula warns him to be wary of the impact. Sensing the danger, he asks Yuri to get back in his eye, and she does so. The boss monster is so ferocious that it causes the ground to rattle just by walking over it. Ursula warns that a punch will come his way real soon, and Ayn prepares himself for the counter. The situation is so tense that the old Ayn would have been crying out of fear by now, but the new Ayn is different. He shows the golem why, smashing the fireball. To his surprise, the monster not only counters it but fires back as well. Ayn realizes that he needs to use brute magic, and Ursula warns him that he can only use it once before collapsing. Luckily he has Yuri with him, and she can quickly heal him and equip him with more power. Ayn uses the Nova attack, and the golem takes a huge hit from the spell. With a single attack, Ayn manages to defeat the dungeon boss, allowing him to finally claim the dungeon core. Soon after, Ayn gains a host of powerful defensive abilities. Defense has always been his greatest weakness, but now, equipped with S-rank defense abilities, he feels confident that any defense-related challenges are finally behind him. As he turns around, he is shocked to find Ursula standing next to him. Ayn immediately questions why she has left the tree. Ursula explains that what he perceives as the tree is actually equivalent to the whole tree itself, and as long as she stays with him, it's safe to leave. The moment transforms into a heartfelt mother-daughter reunion between Ursula and Yuri, until Ayn interrupts them. Ursula then explains her true reason for being there to examine the dungeon core. She points out that it bears a resemblance to the spirit core suggesting it could further strengthen Ayn's eye. She knowingly asks if Ayn would like to enhance his eye further, and as always, his answer is an enthusiastic yes, wasting no time. Ursula equips him with the enhancements. To test his newfound abilities, Ursula hurls a series of fireballs at him. To everyone's surprise, Ayn manages to deflect them all with ease. His growth is undeniable, and Ayn's confidence soars as he begins to realize the full extent of his newfound powers. Now that they have defeated the boss, Ayn is gearing up to become even stronger. Their only remaining target is to get back to the surface. As soon as they leave the place, the huge door behind them closes instantly. 
Jane questions what this means, and Ursula happily explains that the door has been sealed forever, ensuring no one can reach Yggdrasil again. This means Yuri can now live a peaceful life. However, that's not all further surprises await him. The hole through which Ain fell onto the tree has been filled, as if it was never there. This means all possible entrances have been sealed, leaving only the way out. Ain can see light gleaming from the outside. He rushes out of the dungeon and his joy knows no bounds. He is over the moon, seeing the blue sky, the sun, and the white clouds. It's Yuri's first time in the open, and she quietly takes in everything. Shortly after Aang drops a bombshell he's thinking of quitting adventuring. He feels he has no reason to continue since he now possesses heaps of treasure that he can sell for a fortune. However, he decides he'll have to sell it on the black market, because people have always seen him as a rookie. Good for nothing. If he sells anything valuable, others will doubt him and accuse him of stealing. With this plan in mind, he considers using the money for a world tour with his savior Yuri. But Yuri has other plans she wishes to find her family, the other Wigdrasil dresses. It turns out Yggdrasil was once whole but split into nine, each part forming a separate entity through its branches. The other eight are now located in different regions and dungeons. Ain quickly adjusts his plan. He still wants to travel the world but now has a new goal to help Yuri reunite with her family. Yuri is overjoyed upon hearing this, and their journey takes on a new purpose.